Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome back to the School Transportation Nation podcast. I'm Tony Corbin, publisher and president of School Transportation News. Excited to have you back with us in this brand new year. This podcast brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software, our friends at IC Bus, and Student Transportation of America, a leader in school transportation services. Also with me is Mr. Ryan Gray, editorial extraordinaire. Ryan, welcome, sir. Happy New Year, Tony. Happy New Year to the nation. Hope everyone had a restful and relaxing winter break and got lots of good presents. Yeah, well, you know, kids are back in school for some and not for others. I know my kids are like in camps. We're trying to keep them busy. So uh, always an ongoing process. So we're excited to get the kids back in school, Ryan, and uh, get them flowing. And, you know, to get school transportation professionals ready, we got our 2024 buyer's guide and January issue out on the street. If you guys haven't seen them, you can go to the STN Online website, stnonline.com. Check out the 2024 buyer's guide in January issue with a focus on special needs. Uh, Ryan and I are going to be uh, diving into some of that data in just a minute. Uh, also, we have a special guest this week, Keith Kruger, the CEO of the Consortium for School Networking, also known as COSIN. So uh, he's going to be talking a little more about school bus Wi-Fi specifically. Uh, Keith is a technologist and uh, a technology trailblazer, according to many uh, media sources out there. And uh, Ryan can dive deeper on that. But definitely an interesting guest. Uh, we might see Keith also speaking at STN Expo this summer. So stay tuned for more updates on that as well. So before we dive into some of the details on the Buyer's Guide in January issue, we have a special message from our sponsor. This message is brought to you by Student Transportation of America, a leader in school transportation services. STA operates more than 22,000 vehicles throughout the U.S. and Canada, delivering safe and reliable transportation and fleet services to public and private schools. STA is committed to moving the industry towards a greener future and positively impacting the health of passengers and the planet through their use of electric vehicles, alternative fuels, and other green fleet initiatives. To learn how Student Transportation of America may be able to help your district, visit RideSTA.com. That's www.RideSTA.com. All right, Ryan. I mean, the always benchmark for industry health is how our OEM friends are doing in terms of manufacturing deliveries. We break down in our 2024 Buyer's Guide the production data of the OEMs, and we knock it down also by fuel type. So it's always interesting to see the trends with EVs as well as propane and natural gas. And then we also look at vehicle type, type A, uh, as well as broken down by A1, A2, and then, you know, C and D to kind of round it out. So you want to kind of go down the numbers a little bit and break it down for the audience. I know you guys can go to scenonline.com and check out the buyer's guide, but it's always good to hear it from the man himself, Mr. Ryan Gray. So Ryan, Take it away, man. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot, obviously, about coming out of COVID, uh, that recession, um, the supply chain issues, the uh, elongated period to uh, obtain new orders. Some folks are, you know, waiting 12 months, 18 months, sometimes longer to get new bus orders. Uh, talking to the bus OEMs, I know uh, heading into 2023, a lot of their order books were already filled, just trying to catch up with demand and catch up with, with production, uh, you know, filling the previous year's orders. So it was good in uh, surveying the OEMs uh, this past fall in October and November to see them report a spike in school bus production up a little bit over 17% from the previous 2021, 2022 cycle uh, 38,528 units. Uh, so, uh, again, an over 17% increase. Uh, and, and when we're looking at, Tony, uh, the, how the numbers dipped during the COVID years, obviously, for a good year um, or so, there were few, if any, school buses on the road. Orders uh, really kind of ceased. And then, like I mentioned, coming out of that, uh, some of the uh, the supply chain issues that really hit the automotive industry, hit trucking, and of course, as an extension, hit school busing. Uh, so seeing the, those numbers bounce back a little bit, 
uh, that that was a good sign. I think that still, you know, this this industry historically uh, is behind in its replacements. Uh, we, you know, the funds what we see like the the current you know five year five billion dollar uh, EPA clean school bus program. Um, that helps, uh, you know, EPA has been funding uh, school bus uh, retrofits and, and school bus uh, replacements for, you know, a couple decades now, really, if you, if you want to go back to, you know, pre-2010. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of states programs, California really leading the way with all of the, the, the ABC alphabet soup funding that they have there. Uh, but, you know, still the, the industry, it's always that uh that topic of discussion where you know getting uh replacements getting new buses into fleets being school districts being able to afford those buses uh so again while the the 38,528 that's a that's a good number really you know the folks that I talk to in the industry say that it needs to be year over year around the 45,000 um, number. Um, and we haven't seen that for a few years now. The last time it got close to that was 2018, 2019. So just before COVID with 44,781, the year before that 44,634. Um, so there was a few years there where we were right in the, in that ballpark. And just as things happen with recessions, um, and just the, the general economy, uh, if, if anything starts to sour, School districts will get eventually impacted by that. We talk a lot about uh, school busing being recession proof, uh, maybe more so than a lot of industries. But you know, inevitably, the the, the axe will will fall if the the property tax revenues that fund school districts dry up a little bit, or there's some shortfalls. We have we do see some some downturns in some school bus uh, production. So again, it's always kind of like chasing the tail. Uh, the industry is always trying to, to uh, you know, find that that perfect uh, balance um, with with orders, and and certainly you know the OEMs um, they are out there in force, um, and you know we've talked a lot about uh, with the manufacturing, uh, you know a lot of the the school bus manufacturers are all right now coming out of uh, Christmas. Some of them had some Christmas breaks, others at the Type A. Um, didn't because, of course, we had that United Auto Workers strike last year to contend with, too. There's been a shortage of chassis, especially type A uh, chassis, um, you know, the the van cutaways. Uh, but again, you know, there's some some positive um, outlook. Um, some of the folks I talked to uh, point to continued easing of the supply chain. There's still some pressures out there, uh, but, you know, things are going in the right direction. In terms of fuel type, uh, another interesting thing we saw, Tony, uh, was electric uh, surpassed propane for third on the list. So diesel continues to be uh, the most produced. Uh, we had 22,970, so just shy of 23,000 units. Uh, gasoline um, dipped a little bit. It had been around 10, 11,000. It was uh, 9671. And then we had electric coming in at uh, in number three position, 2902. Reaching past uh, propane, which was which was fell to eighteen fourteen, it had been around twenty five hundred to three thousand units, uh, kind of year over year, as a lot of you recall. Uh, and some of that is, uh, well, a lot of it really is based on uh, the that clean school bus program from the EPA, right? Uh, because so much of it is favoring electric. What we saw ninety percent. Um, give or take of all the applications that came in in both year one uh, rebate as well as the uh, what we're seeing so far from uh, the competitive uh, um, applications that ran over last summer, uh, you know the majority of folks are are targeting electric buses. So that certainly um, you know uh, attests to that um, kind of flip flop there. Uh, but also too, what we're looking at with propane, Tony, we've talked a lot about this is. There's really, and as we head now in, we're into 2024, there's only one option currently uh, if you're if you're wanting to buy a propane school bus. Uh, we're going to see that change in a in a couple years once Cummins uh, gets its new engine uh, online. Uh, but you know, again, folks uh, um, will be making some some purchase decisions. What do they do? 
Uh, so it's interesting to see how these numbers will will shake out as, as we go forward. Yeah, I know looking at the numbers, Ryan, we had kind of prognosticated and in, in what you're referring to obviously is the PSI engine platform basically being sunsetted on IC and Thomas vehicles and Bluebird basically having the sole engine provider through Roush Cleantech. So we'll, we'll definitely see a shakeup, I think, on the propane numbers next year. Um, and I don't know if that's people moving more to Bluebird as a brand or is that um, people holding off and waiting until Cummins is available, which that's an unknown date, right? I think anecdotally people say, oh, it's coming, it's coming. And then it's like, well, it's not here yet. Eventually it'll be here. And I think we've talked previously that Cummins is focused on their Octane product, which is their gas engine, because that supports more of the consumer automotive market, specifically that Dodge Ram, uh, which they provide that that engine to. So, so definitely um, – they're putting their resources towards getting their their main bread and butter engine, the Octane, out the door, and then they can shift their their mind to other uh, other products on the roadmap. But for now, the school bus industry has to kind of wait and see uh, how this plays out. But it will be interesting, and and uh, you know, I think there's definitely people on the ESB side that are like, "Hey, look, electric's not for me. Don't force me to do it." Um, so, you know, you definitely are seeing uh, more and more people come out and say that really they're not interested in electric. I'm not sure it's going to be a choice downstream. We'll see uh, how the market and how legislation uh, and regulation kind of dictates that. But for sure, uh, I would see an increase in diesel purchasing. I know when we looked at our purchase data within the buyer's guide, diesel school buses was like top of the list. So if that kind of stays on the trend line, people are going to try to get their diesels in. And this is again, before the GHG regs go into effect and the cost of those engines goes up, right? Because I think we've talked about this, Ryan, it it becomes a, a cost thing where we talk about cost parity. Well, it might be that the diesel prices are going to increase to be more in line with electric. Now, I'm not sure it'll be exact. Uh, we'll see where where the scalability of this all shakes out, but it'll be very interesting to see how price impacts choice uh, in terms of long-term strategy of fueling and and serviceability to students within people's communities. Absolutely. And, you know, um, speaking to to the, the diesel, you're right in the buying wish list, uh, that we have in the in the buyer's guide, uh, new diesel buses, engines, and components, along with Type C and D buses, lead the way um, at twenty eight percent of you know six hundred and seventy six readers that responded to a survey that we we conducted um, earlier in in twenty twenty three, and you know you're right, you know looking at price parity. I think, you know, everyone's talking about, hey, you know, diesel is going to be more expensive. You mentioned the uh, the EPA um, GHG phase two um, that's going into effect now. Um, and we have another one, GHG phase three, uh, that uh, their EPA is trying to finalize that would go into effect for 2032. Uh, so we definitely see uh, diesel, um, you know, being regulated out of the space eventually uh and, and that's no no um no secret we've been talking about that that was a lot of the the conversations we had in in the past year both on the podcast and in the the magazine um but um you know diesel is still here though um and it, you still look at today's diesel um depending on the state you're in because again you know so those 13 states that follow the California Air Resources Board regulations that's becoming harder and harder, um, if not impossible, to get diesels in those states. We've seen some of the states like Oregon push back and say, hey, we're going to delay a year. Um, so they were supposed to January 1st, 2024, you know, a few days ago, they were supposed to follow the the carb clean truck uh, rule and not allow diesel bus purchases anymore, school buses. Well, they, they pushed that back to 2025. Uh, so, you know, there's still going to be diesels available. They're, yes, they're going to be more expensive, but comparing them to today's electric buses, a lot of folks are going to continue 
to 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 buy those if they can. Uh, and you know, you, you talk to the again the EPA folks with the the grant money. They're looking to use that money not to to pay for an entire electric school bus or a fleet of electric school buses, but cover that incremental cost. And you know, again, everybody's waiting for that that point of price parity, and we're we're still not there yet. The crystal ball for whatever you know, whatever good that is. I mean, you know, you would hope that as, as you look at laws like in California and in New York, those two states leading the way with saying, "Hey, um, by 2035, uh, New York is even more aggressive. 2035 is when they say all school buses, entire fleets have to be electric. California says that's when the new purchase has have to start." There's some other states, too, that have some similar regulations, maybe on a more limited scale. Uh, but again, you know, you, you would hope that by by that time frame, we would see price parity. And that's, again, what we're just waiting on. And, you know, again, time will, will tell. Yeah, Ryan, other highlights from the buying wish list were LED lights, uh, lighting, tires and wheels, uh, brake products, Uh, mirror products and uh, GPS and vehicle tracking, kind of our top, our top line list, some lubricants, additives and fuel services as well. So you guys can go uh, on page 14 of the buyer's guide. We've got that buying wish list. Uh, It was out of uh, 676 reader responses. So uh, really interesting data in terms of purchasing. Uh, Again, people could say they want to purchase multiple items to uh, raise those percentages, but uh, a very interesting thing for purchasing over the next 12 months. What are you interested in as a school district or company? And uh, that was kind of what we saw. So uh, very interesting data, Ryan, always uh, wanting to see where people get their information from, where they value it. Uh, our top 10 places uh, you guys value is number one was conferences and trade shows for the information you need to make important decisions about purchasing. Number one. So don't forget to sign up for that STN Expo Uh, We're going to be opening up registration this summer. Uh, So you got uh, registration opening mid-January for the shows, STN Expo Indianapolis, STN Expo in Reno. And these are great places to connect with suppliers, catch up on the latest trends, always great stuff. Check out stnexpo.com for all the latest information, get the latest discounts. We got that super early bird discount going to be coming out. So take advantage of that savings for your district or company. So great stuff, guys, and want to be sure you guys get all that information. And then also just to segue, Ryan, our January issue had a focus on special needs transportation, obviously coming off our TSD conference. So there was a lot of in-depth content in there. Any highlights you could recommend to the readers to check out in January? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, coming out of TSD, of course, a lot of great information there. Uh, There was a, a lot of talk in Frisco, Texas in November around wheelchair securements. And, uh, you know, we, we'd written pretty exclusively, I think we talked about this on, on one of the, the previous podcasts earlier in 2023, kind of ramping up, talked about um, some, some high profile cases um, that, have, that have impacted the industry. One of the most recent last summer where a student was choked to death on her school bus, um, the aide wasn't paying attention um, and it basically came to a, she did not have a crotch strap in her wheelchair. She slid down, kind of submarined, choked to death. She was not verbal. Um, the, the Again, the aide was wearing ear pods and on her phone, just things that she shouldn't have been doing. Criminally negligent, that's what, you know, she's been arrested and she's going to be tried for manslaughter in this case. Um, but, you know, looking at um, the, the total securement of the child, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, when these these children who ride wheelchairs, the court, you know, however, their their individualized education program is written, uh, you know, the 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 least restrictive in, environment is always what this industry wants to go toward. So if possible, these children are in wheelchairs, they might need to, to be in a wheelchair to get to the bus to be to get inside the bus. But if possible. Uh, this industry trains uh, drivers and aides to try to, to transport those students to an actual school bus seat. Um, and, and hopefully they can be, you know, um, properly restrained in that seat. If for those students that cannot be, however, 
uh, they need to have securement points or their wheelchair needs to be secured to the actual bus floor and to the, to the bus uh, itself. Uh, and so that we have a, a great uh, article um, by our Ruth Ashmore, our uh, associate editor, and she's our, our social media um, coordinator as well. So she dives into that, talks with some some of our the leading experts, a lot of the folks that you know we utilize every year at TSD on our both our tenured faculty and our board of advisors. So that's a great art article to check out. Also, looking at the rise of vans, you know we we've, we've had several articles over the past year that are looking at aspects of vans. And when we're talking vans, we're talking those GMC Savannas or, you know, those types of, of vehicles, not type A school buses. A lot of folks refer to type A's as vans. Uh, that's one of the nomenclatures, for example, in New York State. Uh, but we're talking about actual vans, so non-yellow school buses. And we've seen an increase. Some of that driven by a lot of these alternative transportation companies. Uh, and uh, transportation network companies that are now contracting with school districts to provide this additional service to certain students, whether they have special needs or, you know, a lot of them also be, uh, who are experiencing homelessness. So we, we look at um, a school bus supplement. Um, a lot of folks, there's a lot of folks, the, the tried and true that say absolutely not. There are school bus purists. Uh, they point out that uh, it's really towing the, the letter of the federal law that prohibits uh, non-conforming 15 passenger vans from being used uh, being for school transportation, either being sold by dealers or being purchased by school districts. But um, as we've mentioned in a previous article as well, um, and in this article this month, uh, the today's vans that are more like eight or nine passengers, maybe 10 passengers with a driver, do they fall under that congressional ruling from back in the 70s that started really getting the the school bus um, FMVSS Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards written in the late 70s that whole act that 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 really was the vehicle for that push and which has really resulted in our our fantastic school bus safety record so you know but things change and and you know school districts have pressures obviously with the driver shortage uh, but, you know, a lot of the folks we talked to, they said that that should not be the reason you go to vans. Um, there's other aspects to that. So, you know, that article dives into that that topic. And I know it's, you know, front and center and top of mind of a lot of folks right now. You know, how do they get the vehicles they need? And going back to our, you know, what we were talking about with the buyer's guide, um, you know, these vehicles are, are a lot less expensive than school buses as well. But, you know, where's the trade off? Do you trade off the safety of the students for a vehicle that um, is, you know, better able to be to be purchased. That's that's a hard argument to make, and probably not the, the right one. So it's a it's another interesting look at uh, operational impacts um, and this the the pressures being placed on student transporters. Yeah, lots of good stuff there on that January issue. I invite you guys to go check that out on the stnonline.com website. Guys, we're gonna take a quick break and get a message from our sponsor. Do you remember a time when you could just cherry pick the best solution to run your school transportation operation? The best routing software may be one company. The best parent app could be another company. Those days are over. TransFinder said the old way of doing business doesn't work for today's busy and burdened school transportation departments. They need one partner, one solution. TransFinder has embraced this approach for years now, building award-winning solutions like RouteFinder Plus, the driver app Wayfinder, parent app Stout Finder, and inventory management solution service finder they also have field trip management solutions trip finder and viewfinder which provide critical routing information to other stakeholders in the district add to this transfinders award-winning hardware and industry's best support and service you have the ingredients that make up one partner one solution it's not just a slogan it's transfinders way of doing business learn more by emailing get plus at transfinder.com or calling 800-373-3609 that's 800-373-3609 3609. Remember, one partner, one solution. 
Okay, we're back. Ryan, let's talk. We had a big announcement from the FCC releasing the eligible service list for E-rate for school bus Wi-Fi funding. I know we had discussed this a little bit prior to the new year uh, about the FCC passing E-rate funding for school bus Wi-Fi and really kind of solidifying the school bus as an extension of the classroom. And I wrote my article in the January issue specifically asking that question and describing kind of what were the things and the key elements going on with this particular topic. And, you know, it's always the the rub of, oh, are students really going to learn? Are they there to do that? Oh, they have their own devices. Well, you know, a lot of schools provide one-to-one devices, tablets, laptops. You know, it's really up to the student to get access. And a lot of students, as we found, don't have access to Wi-Fi or internet at home. And now that the pandemic's over, you know, that necessarily hasn't changed. So how are we as an industry going to embrace this new uh, ruling from the FCC in terms of allowing Wi-Fi on school buses? Are we going to take advantage of it, of the program and start giving students the accessibility? Why should school transportation even get involved in the educational process? Why should we be there? Right. I think it becomes a student success story. Like, how do we promote student success? People talk about it all the time. Here is our opportunity to participate in this component of learning outside of a physical building on a school campus. And it definitely could be the case because, you know, the ride times vary for kids. It could be 15 minutes or 50 minutes, but that shouldn't diminish the opportunity for a child to learn. Now, granted, they may use that time to be social, interact with their peers, goof around, but it doesn't mean that's happening every day. So we definitely want to provide as an industry if the funding is there. And again, one of the bigger elements to we talked about was the the reason people held back on this was because there was not sustained funding. We saw some funding come through during COVID uh, from the FCC to outfit school buses with Wi-Fi, but it wasn't a long-term fix, right? It was a short-term Band-Aid. And now we've got a long-term uh, sustainable funding element. And yeah, so Ryan, you want to dive into what is the eligible service list for E-Rate? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, as you mentioned, you know, with the eligible services list that FCC uh, released, you know, just prior to to Christmas, December 15th, you know, basically uh, what we're looking at is, you know, on average, FCC says it's about $1,840 per bus per year to to install Wi-Fi hotspots. uh, And to to pay for the the data. Um, So that is that that equipment. Um, those those data plans that is ex- acceptable eligible funding um, under E rate. Uh, the the applications right now uh, need to be being worked on. Uh, we have dates coming up in February and March, so you can check out more of the details on stnonline.com our article. Uh, but uh, essentially, you're, you're right, Tony. Here's that that I guess you could say in perpetuity, um, at least as as far as we can see down the road that this money is going to be um, available to school districts. So we're going to talk with Keith Kruger from COSIN um, a little bit later. He's really an expert uh, on the E-rate program. And of course, you know, so what we're looking at is now school bus is eligible. What does that mean to student transportation leaders? What do they need to know? Um, A lot of schools obviously should have um, a lot of prior knowledge of E-rate. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, of sharing of information and, and transportation probably will will be relying a lot on the libraries and, and IT departments that are already working um, with these funds for guidance. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, some of those will see take over some of the actual implementation of, of these. But so, you know, Keith will, will kind of give us a little bit of a lay of the land. Um, but one of the interesting things um, that that I saw in this in this uh, eligible services list announcement was that you know the FCC is really targeting um, you know uh, educational purposes. So that is the only acceptable use um, of FCC funded school bus Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, we're looking at home to school. Um, 
or other quote unquote school related activities when there is a clear educational purpose for enabling school bus Wi Fi connections outside of the normal classroom hours. So that that could be some you know educational uh, activity trips. Um, I, again, we're going to need to get more clarity on this. I think Keith can give us some of that in a little bit. Um, can school districts use these for sports trips? That's, you know, that's where it's, you know, it's getting pretty dicey. It looks like, you know, no, but we need to, to this is what the industry is going to be looking to, to clarify in, as it goes forward. And in uh, what a lot of folks have told me, and you're, you're right, Tony, you mentioned this, that a lot of the folks that have shied away from the Wi-Fi was because it, it, you know, they just didn't see um, the the need to um, allocate money to that, and they might not have had any money um, going forward um, for on a long term basis. E rate certainly changes that, um, so we'll really have to see what the the take rate is. Uh, you know, in looking at um, our buying wish list again, looking back to the buyer's guide, only thirteen percent. Um, so a little bit, you know, farther down the list of those 676 readers said that Wi-Fi or onboard student connectivity was really on their radar. Now, this survey was conducted before FCC, you know, approved um, school bus Wi-Fi under its eligible funding. Um, will this change? Uh, again, you know, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but uh, but time will tell. Yeah, buying trends also based on the funding, Ryan. So I agree with you that because the survey was conducted prior to this information being released. And then, you know, there's still information coming out uh, specifically on what is eligible. Uh, what does that mean? What can you buy physically with the funding? And school buses are eligible for category one service. That basically includes equipment like antennas, routers, modems, as well as the associated installation services, software, and data services fees. Mm -hmm. So when you've got all that together, that sounds pretty comprehensive in terms of what the offering is. So really, there's a nominal cost and the benefit is probably very great. And, you know, I think what are the ancillary benefits that school transportation achieves from this? And we talked a lot about this is, is behavior adjusted. Now, if students are focused on their devices and not necessarily games and stuff, but educational content through all the apps that schools offer. Do we see an improvement in student behavior? What are the other unrealized benefits that could potentially come from this? Mm -hmm. So how can we take advantage of it as an industry, as well as furthering education? And I'd be very curious to see if the schools themselves don't think about this as a potential opportunity because it's never really been part of the educational ecosystem but with this funding being available, and as you kind of alluded to, other stakeholders in the technology department, in the libraries department, do they see this and say, wow, the school bus can be used for this purpose, and now the FCC is going to support it? Maybe there's more we could do here. So is there an expansion of the educational opportunity here or learning time? And kind of as you said, schools are reimbursed based on learning time. Is there more learning time that's occurring on a school bus? And is that actually going to be documented in some way? So be very curious to see if there's other things that come forward in years to come with regards to this kind of game changer. Yeah. And, and you mentioned like, you know, games and whatnot, you know, again, you know, the FCC is pretty clear. It says, you know, it expects applicants to implement content and user network restrictions consistent with the restrictions that they place on their building based broadband network as described in their acceptable use policies. Uh, so and, and we know that providers uh, like a Khajiit or a Premier Wireless, uh, they they have very robust systems um, and, and, and firewalls. And, and another interesting aspect of uh, this E-Rate announcement really, you know, comes from the Learning Without Limits initiative that uh, FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel um, first proposed last year, and then it, it became this, this E-Rate um, eligible 
um, funding mechanism. Uh, but there, there's a couple of other aspects to it. And, and school bus Wi-Fi on the E-rate uh, list is just phase one. So another phase is um, looking at cybersecurity. And certainly there's a lot of, you know, aspects that we're looking at here in the industry about cybersecurity. Currently, we're working on some articles uh, regarding, you know, a, a, a breach that, that occurred uh, with, with a company and kind of their response to it um, in terms of routing and in apps that go out to parents uh, that show school bus location or where their, their kids get off, on and off the school bus. Very sensitive information. Uh, and, you know, how that all kind of interconnects, too, because we're talking about broadband, right? We're talking about, you know, regardless if, you know, you have the FCC eligible funding for the, the, uh, the educational purposes on the, on the school bus, uh, but you also have a, a lot of fleets now that are transitioning to Wi-Fi-based data um, or broadband data, you know, with, in terms of GPS and, and routing. So while those... That, that aspect from an operational standpoint is not funded by FCC. You can see there when you're talking about the entire ecosystem, you know, network security and, and cybersecurity, that has to be, you know, for everything. So um, that's going to be another, you know, interesting aspect to, to see, you know, how that um, pilot project um, rolls out by the FCC. And again, you know, Keith um, hopefully can give us a little bit more insight on that in a little bit. Uh, but also, too, something you mentioned, Tony, about, um, you know, piggybacking on my earlier comment about transportation working with IT and libraries. And you were mentioning, you know, how that might extend some of the educational programs. Yeah, I'm just kind of, you know, um, thinking aloud here when you were saying that, that my child um, in her elementary school, I mean, there's always these, these different programs. A lot of them are, you know, fundraising type programs for, for their school district or their school. Um, but a lot of them have an educational aspect to them. So I'm just thinking, you know, how number one, you know, libraries might be able to work with transportation to utilize that Wi-Fi network on the school bus to extend some of their their reading programs. Um, and then what you were also mentioning uh, with school districts getting, you know, a large uh, amount of their their state funding based upon average daily attendance, right? That's really what most of the states um, that that's their their benchmark. You know, will we see average daily attendance increase tied to school buses where there's Wi-Fi on the, on the, on board, and you know maybe kids are able to get some of their homework done on the school bus, getting into class where they wouldn't have been able to to previously, so they just don't go maybe because they don't they don't have that project ready. You know, again, these are the things that we're going to see play out with with Wi-Fi. Yeah. Well, Ryan, let's get to your interview uh, with Keith Kruger. But before we do that, take a quick break from our sponsor. Today's tech tip is brought to you by IC Bus. Looking for ways to improve your on-time performance and reduced operating costs? All IC Bus CE Series school buses come standard with a factory installed telematics device, including a five year connectivity subscription. You'll gain access to on command connection, an industry leading remote diagnostic solution providing data that is visible, easy to understand, and actionable. With OCC, your school district will have visibility to vehicle health and performance data at your fingertips, including EV specific information like state of charge and estimated range learn about other standard capabilities of their connected vehicles at icbus.com that's icbus.com i want to welcome to the school transportation nation podcast stage keith kruger chief executive officer of the consortium of school networking cosin for short keith thank you so much for joining us hi ryan great to be here today so I'm uh, really excited to have Keith on today. Uh, he was uh, uh, part of some of our coverage uh, in the fall when the Federal uh, Communications Commission uh, approved uh, the E-rate funding for school bus Wi-Fi. So COSIN is plays a big role in, in school networking, school technology. Uh, Keith is one of the foremost experts uh, at school Technology. He's a technologist. He's an award-winning influencer in the in the IT tech 
K through 12 world. Uh, so Keith, you know, I, I definitely want to pick your brain and I think our, our audience wants to hear from you uh, since you have a lot and Kosin has a lot of uh, experience with E-Rate. And so this is a, a new thing for student transporters all across the nation. Uh, but first, I alluded to a little bit of your background. Why don't you tell our, our listeners more about yourself and your experience? Sure. Uh, and uh, Ryan, congratulations on the great coverage of, of this issue. So Kosin is a nonprofit professional association of heads of technology of our school districts. And uh, uh, it's been around for just over 30 years and I've been running COSIN for almost all those 30 years. So my background really is in public policy uh, and building coalitions. So although I run an education technology association, I'm not a technologist per se, but um, uh, we've been very excited. The E-Rate program, I don't know as you said, a lot of your audience might not be as familiar with it, but it's been the key essential funding for technology of schools and libraries. It started back in the late 1990s, uh, and each year, it's not a grant program. Uh, it, it, the way it gets funding is when you pay your telecommunications bill. There's those little lines, those fees for universal service. And that one of the things universal service is making sure that schools and libraries are connected to the internet. And we've made sure that it stays more up to date, for instance, with broadband, not just a simple low speed connection. Um, we're very excited about this new uh, learning without limits uh, proposals, and one of them is Wi-Fi on school buses. And in fact, it's the first of three areas that has actually now been implemented. Uh, what happens uh, with the E-Rate program is school districts determine what they need, and they put out a, a form, Form 9. 90, which says what they need, and they get bids from the private sector for it. And what they're looking for is a discounted special, the lowest price available for the service that it is. And through the E-Rate program, uh, it gets discounted even more based on poverty. But it is a discount program. They don't get it for free. So school districts aren't going to needlessly just buy things that they don't need because they do have to provide a certain amount of match. The Wi-Fi and buses, we think, is very important. In fact, a couple, I would say five years ago, we started working with Google. They had learning uh, I forget what the name of it was now, but it was Wi-Fi and buses. And what we found was uh, there's a lot of uh, potential instructional time uh, where students can do their homework. And uh, not only does it have a benefit for learning, but it also has an impact uh, on uh, behavior. For instance, I'm sure school bus drivers will tell you it's better having the kids look at their screen than <laughs> fooling around, hitting each other and things like that. So we we see a lot of benefits, and the the E-rate program uh, certainly it connects classrooms, but at school it also provides connections in the cafeteria or in hallways where students can continue to do their schoolwork. And so what we're thinking now of the school bus as really being an extension of that classroom, and it really allows them, especially in places where they have long commutes for students to recapture some of that time and get uh, a head start on their work. And of course, uh, other students or, or so many students have other activities like sports or debate or whatever. And that those hours, especially if you live in rural America, you know, can often be very long. And so this is a, a way to recapture that kind of time. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it, it's interesting in, in looking at this eligible services list that uh, we reported on, and it came out just, you know, December 15th, so less than a month ago, uh, right before Christmas break. Uh, so it might have flown under some people's radars, but, you know, I think a lot of the folks in the industry knew it was coming. Yet again, like as I mentioned earlier, and you alluded to, and there's not a lot of experience that student transporters have with it per se, but certainly 
in the larger school districts, there are um, others that that do, and you obviously libraries. Um, I think we we talked before we started recording about the the role that uh, IT departments could play. Um, before we start, kind of looking at uh, what the the E rate program will cover and won't cover. Let's talk a little bit about. Uh, the relationship that uh, the, the kind of the inner school district relationship that maybe transporters need to have or be aware of. Um, you mentioned, you know, going out to bid um, and there's some forms um, that are going to be due. I think the one forms due next month in February and other ones due in, in March. It's kind of like that application period, I guess. And, you know, you said it wasn't, it's not a grant program per se, but talk a little bit about for, for the, the neophyte transporter who has never worked with E-Rate before. What's kind of their next step? Well, probably if school, school bus companies are working with the transportation department, they, they also may not know about the E-Rate program, but it's highly likely that someone in the district, probably the technology department, have been applying for E-Rate for years and years. In fact, you know, 99.9% .9 of school districts do receive E-Rate funding. So uh, someone in the school district does that. They also, some school districts use E-rate consultants to help them with their application, especially if they're a larger district. And because, you know, it's a federal program, so there is complexity to it. Uh, I would think that uh, school uh, bus companies will want to learn more about that. And one of the first steps they might want to do is go to what's called the E-Rate Productivity Center the, or EPEC, EPC. It's, it's the main portal where all forms and applications are filed. Uh, so you want to go there and become eligible uh, and sign up to uh, and also to find out what school districts uh, that you serve might uh, be looking for Wi-Fi and buses. Okay. And the website for that, that that's a, a, a page from the Universal Service Administrative uh, Company, uh, correct? So that you can go to www.usac.org to find more information on that E-Rate Productivity Center. Um, but... You know, Keith, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, again, what's what's eligible and what's not. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the consulting services. And and one of the things that I was looking at, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in the uh, ESL, so the, what's being funded in FCC says on average, it's about $1,840 per school bus per year to outfit it with um, Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, give or take again. Um, but so the the funding is really covering the equipment in the installation. So we're talking about antennas, modems. Yes. And the service. And, and the service, the, the data, right? Yeah. But some of the consulting you mentioned, because you said, you know, some of the, the larger districts, obviously, I mean, if they have 1,500 buses <laughs> or, or more, um, you're really going to need an expert to, to help you um, – you know, go go through the weeds, if you will. Um, but some of those consulting services are not um, eligible. Is that correct? I think that's right. But and how they get paid exactly, I don't. It would depend on the consultant, I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So, um, so in, in terms of uh, you know, again, extension of the classroom, you hit it, and that was that's a really big. Um, a, a big thing for this industry. Uh, folks have been talking about school bus as an extension of the classroom for a decade or more. I mean, I've been covering this industry for a, for a couple decades now, and mm -hmm. I remember that phrase. But just recently, uh, we've seen the feds and certainly state governments talking about that. We're seeing that extension of the classroom more in, in legislation yeah. that's being introduced or passed in, in states regarding student transportation operations. Now that we have the federal government, the federal, the federal government has been talking about school bus as an extension of the classroom. Like we've seen it with the uh, EPA clean school bus program, the five year, $5 billion um, for both electric and, and basically propane school buses. But now that we have the FCC, Basically, really, you know, codify it, I guess, if you will. It, school bus is an extension of the classroom. And I think this is, there's a real equity aspect to why we think this is so important, because uh, we have largely all classrooms in the United States connected to broadband. But 
when students go outside of class. And, it, you know, you might say, well, does it really matter? Because, you know, after the pandemic, yes, it was critical when students were at home, then we, home connectivity was critical, but now they're back at school. So we've actually been doing some research uh, we did last year looking at uh, access to the school network and more bandwidth and connectivity happens outside of the school than at school. That's not to say that at school isn't important, but it's actually really critical for the homework aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you think, I mean, because kids are in class and granted, you know, there's a lot of one-to-one programs. I know my daughter is in third grade. She's got a Chromebook. Um, so there is some of that being done in classrooms. But for the most part, you're in, yeah. you know, a lecture or you're you're in a work group. Um, and it would make sense that whether you're at the cafeteria, my daughter goes has an after-school rec program that she goes to and they let them use the, the laptops for there. She doesn't ride the school bus, but the kids that could have a yeah. half an hour, 50 minute, I mean... I know like in Prince George's County, Maryland, I think their aver- some of their average routes are like up to 90 minutes. Yeah. You know, so you look at it from that standpoint, um, certainly that equity issue. Um, but also too, you know, I, I'm curious and I'm not sure what COSIN has thought about or, or maybe researched or surveyed regarding it. But uh, Tony Corpin, our publisher, and I were just having a, a conversation before you came on about some of the implications of school bus Wi-Fi and in terms of, you know, we know that average daily attendance is really the the mechanism that drives most schools um, for, for state funding or, or reimbursement. Mm-hmm. May this be something that increases ADA in certain places where if in these, in, in these um, inequitable neighborhoods or areas where students don't have the access or ability to complete their homework, they might, or they may be more prone to stay home, and so they don't have to turn in their homework yet, anyways. And then they can use the school bus now to to help them. I guess those are things that we are remain to be seen, right? Yeah. Well, I I think one of the more interesting things is you're in Southern California and down in the Palm Springs area and one of the high poverty districts of Coachella mm-hmm. a, a number of years ago. Yep. They put Wi-Fi, they were one of the first districts to put Wi-Fi on buses. But the interesting thing they did the next year is they started parking those buses at night uh, in, for instance, trailer park communities that were unconnected. And they used that all night. Now, uh, I will say that the FCC in this particular said, you know, it's only doing uh, reasonable instructional times and they might consider that in the future and look at it. So they're not going to pay for 24-hour coverage uh, in a community on a on a bus but that doesn't mean that a school district couldn't do it on their own mm-hmm. couldn't say we're going to from you know from 6 p.m. to midnight going to provide uh, connectivity with the school bus and does it really matter where you park the bus exactly yeah does it matter where the where the bus driver picks it up in the morning Absolutely. And and we've talked with districts. I know there's a district in Farmington, New Mexico, uh, that has implemented school uh, school bus Wi-Fi several years ago, and they just made it an SOP you know, going forward. They weren't they didn't I don't even believe they applied for any of the emergency connectivity funds because their superintendent just decided this is the right thing to do. Yeah, we have a, a we're, we're a rural district and this is what we're going to do. And they just worked it into their budget. Yeah, there are um, a lot of different strategies. There's no one solution that solves the homework gap or for this digital equity strategy. But uh, in our latest survey, and I don't have it right in front of me, but I think it was something like 15% of school districts said that they were already doing Wi-Fi on buses. I think what uh, the FCC decision on E-rate means that a lot more school districts will be doing it Mm -hmm. uh, and wanting it. I think they're likely to be selective, as you already pointed out. You know, you have to have a long enough commute in order to make it worthwhile. Uh, But many places do, highly urban ones and also highly rural ones. 
Absolutely. And one of the things that I found interesting too in reading the ESL was it appeared that, you know, definitely the the onus is on educational activity. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's some gray area there that you, you might even be able to, to give us a definitive answer on this. But from my reading, my kind of layman's reading, novice reading of it, um, is that there, there could be some usage in, in certain extracurricular activity trips if, again, there's that educational purpose. But something traditionally that we have seen used, like for sports trips where or a band trip where folks, this, you know, that might be an hour, hour and a half, or they might be crossing state lines in some areas to go to a competition, that that might not be covered. So, again, I think that this is an evolving program. I think it is an evolving thing, but uh, you can definitely see the value to the student if they – can stay connected when they're competing in a sport or an activity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And before I let you go, I, I have to ask you to, cause I know I, I re referred um, to uh, it's your own bio <laughs> key. I was reading <laughs> off coast and you were kind of trying to take a step. I'm not really a technologist, but, but I think, you, you know, you have spoken, you know, on several continents about school uh, technology and interconnectivity. I'm curious, obviously we've been talking about Wi-Fi, um, but there's so much technology out there that is you know, pervasive throughout society and we're certainly seeing it not only in the school campuses, but on school buses. You know, you have Wi-Fi, you have emerging, you know, 5G is here, but, you know, will really emerge and, and just, you know, become pervasive across society. Is there 6G coming? We have AI. In your role with COSIN, what, what's your organization's um, kind of outlook in terms of how technology has evolved and how it can be used and is being used? Um, certainly, obviously, we are in this transportation world. Um, certainly, if there's any, any links there with that extension of the classroom, kind of curious what you guys see, if you could read the tea leaves. Well, I think you're asking about kind of the, to predict the, the future of mm -hmm. technology, which is a great question and a really difficult one because <laughs> predictions are even the people who invent technology are often wrong about how it's going to be used. You know, Alexander Graham Bell said that no one would would use the AC current. So, uh, you know, it's hard to see, but I think what we really want to do is invent the future that we want. And so I there is a lot of conversation and discussion about AI, particularly generative AI. And I, I think from a, you know, some of the folks that, that you'll be dealing with the, the operations and, and facilities sort of departments of school systems have great opportunities. For instance, let's take bus schedules. You know how much time it takes to create those? Well, using uh, generative AI is probably the ability to at least uh, create a, a first draft. You ought to proof it and make sure that it's accurate and all of that. But uh, it could be a, an enormous time saver. Uh, we know that in other industry sectors or all industry sectors that uh, start using generative AI, they're saying that there is something like a 30% productivity improvement. So, the you know, even internally for communications, the messages to parents uh, and the messages to students using uh, something like generative AI to improve that uh, and can help you in a disaster. Uh, I was talking to a school district from Maine where they had a shooting. You know, there was a shooting that was happening two months ago, and the district had to notify all parents, all the media, uh, and students and faculty. They were able to do it within minutes by using AI to generate those kind of messages. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to get uh, certainly the sectors serving K-12, as well as K-12 uh, school administrators, thinking creatively about how can we, the things that we're already doing today, how can we do them better? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And I know that there's a lot of AI already. Um, we're kind of just scratching the surface of it, mm -hmm. but we're seeing it in routing. We're seeing it in video. We're seeing it obviously in the, the apps that uh, tell parents where their kids are, where the bus is and where they got on and off. You know, you're, you're mentioning Alexander Graham Bell and I'm, I'm, I'm going to murder the, the, the saying, but there's, there's one that's 
semi-famous that goes on something along the lines of that we grossly um, overestimate what what's possible, but yet then we grossly underestimate what actually happens. So absolutely right. It's a it's an interesting time we live in for sure. So you know, I think in the in the technology area, Gartner is the biggest consulting firm for technology, and and they have what's called the hype cycle. And uh, I was just at their annual conference, and they said that uh, AI in K-12 was at the absolute peak of, of the hype. Uh, that means soon we'll come to the, the valley, where people said it didn't do anything, it didn't change anything. But what we really want to look for is that long tail, where really everything changes, and all of a sudden you look around and we, we don't do anything the way we used to. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's what we want to look for. Yeah, so I've already started using AI a little bit, again, scratching the service, but you're right, just from a productivity standpoint, it's it moves the needle, definitely. Yeah. Well, Keith, thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge with us. Uh, look forward to continuing conversations with you as we watch certainly the world of E-Rate and School Bus Wi-Fi evolve. Great. Nice talking to you, Ryan. Have a great week. Ryan, great conversation with Keith today. Appreciate you jumping on, talking with me a little bit about all the great things we got going on at STN. We got that buyer's guide in January issue. Go check that out on stnonline.com. Make sure to keep an eye on stnexpo.com for the latest in updates and get those discounts locked in for the super early bird for STN Expo Indianapolis and STN Expo in Reno. Special thanks to our sponsors today, TransFinder, IC Bus, and Student Transportation of America. Guys, don't forget to visit stnonline.com for all the latest news and analysis on the school transportation industry. We've got you covered too. We got questions, we got answers. Email info at stnmedia.com. We'd be happy to tackle some questions that you might have for us. So please send those in. We're going to be doing more reader question answers on future podcasts here in 2024. Don't forget Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to Pods Nation. Make sure and subscribe so you get our podcast every week on your mobile device, computer. And uh, we appreciate you. We'll love you, Nation. Welcome to 2024. We'll see you next week.